Hello, I'm Jason Ponton, the Editor-in-Chief and the publisher of MIT Technology Review. And we're here to discuss crisis communications after an attack with Andre Kavalets, the Chief Technology Officer of Hewlett Packard Enterprise Security Services, and Vitor Souza, the Vice President of Global Communications at FireEye Inc. So Vitor, let me, let me begin with you. What are companies doing wrong in terms of communicating about cybersecurity breaches? And, and why does that matter? What are the biggest mistakes you see them making and what should they do instead? Well, certainly, you know, the number one mistake that I see out there is that companies actually do not have a cyber crisis plan. You know, it's, uh, it's very much, you know, built into their core business continuity plans is what they currently mm -hmm. have. And as we know, yeah. Andrew can testify here is that, you know, the, when you're under a breach, you know, the situation is very different than if the building catches on fire. Right, so I think that's the first thing that stood out to me all the time is that most companies do not have a cyber crisis management plan. Second is they actually do not do tabletop exercise. So the companies that actually do have a plan, they don't take that plan and actually operationalize and make it real. You know, so how are you going to actually you know, uh, be able to know if the plan works if you're not practicing? So those are the two major things that I, I see a flaw often in the companies right now. Uh, as far as you know, what to do, you know, I mean, I think that you know, being proactive is the, the strategic approach, mm -hmm. right? So building that plan, you know, know what your risk appetite is. You know, most companies know that they are target of attacks, and by knowing that, then create a proactive plan. And then within this plan, you know, there's a couple key elements that I think it's very critical to have there. You know, you've got to assemble your crisis communications team. You know, and that comprises of a, a diverse, you know, different members of the organization. Yep. You gotta have C-suite preparation. You know it's critical. Uh, I, I also often see organizations that do not prepare their C-suite, and then you know that crisis becomes really, really complicated. Then you have to uh, get out there and, and practice. Again, I keep going back to them. Then after you have this plan, you have the crisis, you know, program, and all the things are laid out on the paper. Well, get out there, do your tabletop exercise quarterly. You know the best companies that I'm seeing right now are doing those things quarterly. Every quarter. Every should quarter. Be practicing. And yeah. you know, it's not just the uh, IT guys on the you know the, that should work on that. The C suite preparation, where once you define who the in the C suite is responsible mm -hmm. for the plan, you know, that person should be part of the tabletop exercise. So, you know, if you're doing those, uh, the threat changes often. So if you're not able to train against the different types of threats you're facing, the scenarios we call the, the communications playbooks, they change. Yeah. You know, what you build today could be completely obsolete six months yeah. from now. And I think those are kind of a couple critical things that I call it out. And I think you're right. I think it demands a specific expertise. Now, this is not your average news cycle. This is not your normal communications function. This is a crisis moment for your organization, right? One of the most disruptive you're going to face. And people aren't used to managing a crisis situation at the speed of Twitter when you don't own the news cycle, when, you know, you're being challenged both by an adversary that you sure. don't understand and possibly can't see, but also by you know, customers, by shareholders, by stakeholders, by governments, by you know, the, the, the global, assembled global, global media who are judging you and challenging you to communicate clearly and show command of a situation. That this is not a normal, you know, crisis is the right word. Well, let me drill down that a bit. And so specifically, yeah. what should a crisis communication plan contain in terms of specifically handling a cyber attack or breach? What kinds of questions does it need to answer? Well, I think, first of all, as any communications plan needs, you understand your audiences, right? So you have absolutely a set of legal obligations about whom and where you must communicate and declare what's happened. You need to communicate through you know, less public channels to coordinate the response within your organization. That's very important. You need to communicate to your employees, right? Your employees are the first line and the first really most important line of defense when you're fielding questions from your customers and your you know, employees themselves need to feel that they are being communicated to, they understand the situation, and they can, you know, can give their interpretation of what's happening. And then you step beyond that and you talk about communications plans to media, to stakeholders, to affected parties, to partners. Now, that's just part of it. And that's, you know, that's the composite view of this communications exercise in a crisis situation. But you also have to have a series of platforms that are ready to go. So when it is a major breach, you have a, you know, a website ready to go. Return communication channels so people can ask you questions. So if I'm a consumer and I believe that my personal details may have been stolen or compromised, who do I ask? What do I ask? Am I covered? How, are, how do I feel? And it's really thinking about 
the questions and the motivations of all of those different stakeholder groups and how you communicate individually with them and give them the view that you are both in command of the situation, that their data is your responsibility. And you've got to try and continue to build trust. You know, communicating trust and awareness is really important. Peter, you mentioned that crisis communications begins at the top, or at least it should do, uh, with the board of directors and the C-suite. But how do companies prepare the C-suite for this type of crisis? This normally isn't in the background of most C-level executives. Of course, yeah. And I think, you know, uh, companies today realize that you know, when, when the breach happens, you know, this is no longer an IT problem. This mm -hmm. is now a business issue. So clearly the C-suite needs to be all hands on. But in, as part of the C-suite preparation, there's a couple of things that stand out for me. Is you know, first thing is you gotta determine the risk appetite of your organization with your C-suite, right? How you know you, yeah. you gotta know what you're up against. You know, what type of attacks can you withstand? Are you comfortable in having you know sort of a you know a smaller plan for if your website mm -hmm. is down, which is a totally different thing than if all the personal identifiable information has been taken from your customers, right? So determining the risk appetite is very key. The second thing is, you know, you gotta be able to uh, have the spokespeople within the C-suite prepared mm -hmm. to speak to a variety of different audiences they're not normally used to. So your C-suite's gonna be speaking to the FBI and to other agencies often. You know, not, that's not something that everybody's prepared for all the mm -hmm. time. You know, then you also have to have, a, within the, the overall plan that you have, you have to have a C-suite communications plan mm -hmm. because you become the communications hub mm -hmm. of the crisis. And there's got to be some mm -hmm. very well-defined workflows and things that happen mm -hmm. within the C-suite so that when it happens, they're able to make the right decision. So what does, what does that look like, Andre? How, what are the best practices for keeping the C-suite themselves informed <coughs> about what's going on in real time, I assume? Absolutely. And, you know, the key is that real-time moment. And we all know that when, you're, when, when the lights are on and you're faced with a real-time question, and it could be anything from a, you know, a, a deep technical question, could be anything about a, you know, a political comment about the adversary that's attacking you, you know, or the impact on you know, your con the man in the street for whom you've been privileged to look after their data. You know, the key things that they need to do at that point is you know, remain calm and understand exactly where the boundaries of what's happening, understand what's happening within that crisis, you know, that, that sort of that nerve center. And if we believe and we do in our experience that the first 48 hours of a breach are the most important. They are in any crisis, whether it's a national disaster or a flood. So having the C-suite involved, up to date, and sitting in the room, not being a bottleneck for decisions, yeah. but being aware of what's happening and understanding the context of the communications and the messaging they're projecting is absolutely vital. And you have to practice this stuff. Good executive leadership in these moments allows you to move forward with clarity and coordination. When you, when you get a fractured response, when you're being barraged with you know, law enforcement questions, you know, share price questions, legal questions, technical questions, mm -hmm. actually having that practice and everybody, everybody in the room understanding the parameters and then a clear articulation of what the problem is and what you're doing about it is really important. And when you train, you, you find out who that person needs to be. You're absolutely yeah. right. I mean, I, I echo the sentiment that if you have a really strong leader during the, those crisis moments, you can actually withstand very nicely, you know, mm -hmm. through, the, through the challenge. But, you know, again, you know, through those exercises, you may think that, oh, it needs to be the CEO. But really, if you go through the tabletop exercise, you might identify somebody else mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's better suited. So this is a question for both of you. Talk to me about internal communications, especially for big global companies mm -hmm. that have... Uh, buildings and staff all over the world. When there's been a breach, what do you tell employees and when do you tell them and how? You first, Vito. You know, I think it varies. You know, every scenario is very unique, right? You know, a lot of the, most of the breaches that we actually respond to, those are breaches that you never will see uh, daylight. Mm -hmm. You know, but I would say in the cases where you do need to communicate internally, which there are a lot of them that you do, you know, I think the, the most important thing for, for, for you is that if you already built a security culture within your organization, then you can communicate easier with these people without mm -hmm. the fear of having you know, a leak. I think that mm -hmm. internal communications, the big fear organizations always have is like, if I tell my employees now, you know, are they gonna go out on Twitter and start telling me about that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if they already are built within that security culture and they understand like, you know, changing passwords is good, all companies going through a, you know, some kind of exercise, that you know, they're all part of the team and they yeah, play absolutely. along. Absolutely. How do you build a security culture? <laughs> and that starts top down, yeah. Yeah. and it's really about people understanding their role and, and you know, internalizing the protection of the assets that your company holds. And I think back to the, you know, how do you communicate to employees? 
The worst thing is rumor and conjecture. So giving them the ability to understand how they can communicate that out to everybody who will ask them, say, well, what happened? You know, how's it going? Are you OK? Is the organization OK? They need to be able to have a framework to answer those questions honestly and with some integrity. I think the other piece is quite important that often the, the impact to the, you know, the running of your business in a breach means that certain services won't exist. You might not be able to access all of the tools you need for your job. And you know, how you respond in that situation as an employee is as important not to paralyze your entire organization. You know, if the, if the lifts don't work in, in a building, if the fire alarm goes off, everybody intuitively knows what to do. That culture, that intuition about what to do in, in a crisis situation in a cyber you know, event doesn't exist. And I think we need to yeah. build that culture and awareness and allow people to understand what you do, whether it's password reset, whether it's just yeah. taking the time to, you know, to understand the implications and if they've been affected individually. So Vita, what about communicating with partners and suppliers who, after all, may have been affected as well? When do you communicate with them and, and how? You know, the short answer it varies, but there's a couple you know, key things that you, you can do. You know? And I think the most important thing is being transparent with your partners and your suppliers, but also being able to communicate to them only when you have all the facts that you need mm -hmm. to be able to effectively communicate, communicate what you have, but also you know, making sure that you have you know, communication goals. Like what are you trying to achieve by reaching out to this mm -hmm. partner, by reaching out to the supplier? There's got to be an end to that, not just communicating it out. And I think yeah. that's key. And the, and the nature of, of you know, our integrated supply chains and partners and customers means that most people share information through systematic means. Most people have joint digital assets. So the communication has to also be you know, one that says, we need to work together because this breach is affecting all of us. All of us yeah. right? And that's a very different you know, communications challenge. That's about keeping a working communication between two parties that have to jointly solve a problem. And I think that's really important, that people don't feel excluded. That's built in your communications playbook. You do not want to be in a situation where the breach happened and now you've got to figure out, like, oh, how do we go about contacting them? Yeah. Who do I call? Yeah, who do I call or who do I talk to? You, those things have to be teed up. Um, Andre, with the proviso that every situation is different and, of course, the idea is not having to make any public, public disclosure, when you must tell your customers and the vast, broad of the world, how do you do that and when do you do that? In an ideal world, you would naturally do that, you know, in a controlled situation with all of the facts at your disposal and will have already understood the situation that's unfolded within your organization. And you can be very clear about what you've done and the, the implications and the risks. That ideal world so seldom takes place in the event of a cyber breach because actually you're dealing with a, a lot of moving parts. And so often, you're, you're notified of a breach by a third party. It might be law enforcement, it may be the press, it may be some of your customers have seen their details appear somewhere else. So you're so often in a reactive state having to manage a new cycle that you've not, you've not caused. So actually that ideal situation doesn't exist. And it is a really about standing up, I think about being transparent about what you do and don't know, and empathizing with the situation that's, that, that's happened, but also being very clear about how you're taking control of that situation and how you're protecting the ongoing nature of your business and that of, you know, of your consumers. There's a tension there, isn't there, guys? Because um, the customer wants to hear that the CEO and the company is sorry, yeah. which is often the very last thing that the company's lawyers want them to say. So how does a CEO take responsibility while at the same time not omitting liability? Well, I think, you know, if by, by having a plan, you know, I think that's the, you know, if I'm a customer and I know that this company handle, you know, the crisis in a professional and the right manner, I know that there's a leadership there. So, I mean, that's the way I would, you know, view as a, you know, but I guess as far as the public image, right, it goes, you know, the CEO has a role within those cyber crises. But as you define the different, you know, scenarios that you might go through, you know, there's a couple things that you have to protect. And the CEO sometimes needs to be protected from liability issues. And you know you have to other means and other ways of communicate to customers, and it's still instinct the message that you know the organization is sorry without actually having to have the CEO say those words in front of a camera. And crises by their nature are unique and rare events that people are not naturally uh, designed to handle. I mean, we talked about the need for and the absolute need for you know prediction and preparation in these senses, and I think that's one of the unique things we bring is that. We do this all the time. So we can help you understand and predict what's going to happen, run scenarios and playbooks. Yeah. 
prepare your organization for when that inevitable breach occurs. Ladies and gentlemen, Andre Kavalets and Vita Souza talking about crisis communications in the event of a cyber breach. Thank you very much.